Now there are two really good reasons why you need to do the often overlooked brake fluid change. Hello and welcome back to the Volks Wizard channel. Now this 2013 Audi TT 2.0 T FSI Quattro is actually the longest standing member of the Volks Wizard fleet, having been acquired nearly three years ago. Part of its enduring appeal is that unlike earlier models, its EA888 Gen 2 engine is chain driven and therefore it doesn't require regular cam belt changes. However, fresh oil is more important than ever but the good news is it's a really easy car to work on. So in today's driveway DIY video, I'm gonna show you how easy by performing a two year service, which means a new oil, new oil filter, new pollen filter, and the often overlooked brake fluid change. So let's get started by looking at the parts and the tools required. As usual with our driveway DIY videos, our parts supplier is a company called Deutsche Parts. They've got a warehouse full of 50,000 items which are available for free next day delivery to UK addresses and they also ship globally. They're connected to a network of global part suppliers which means if a part actually exists then there's a really good chance they can get it for you. Also they've got a five star Google review rating which trust me is really really unusual in the world of car parts and they are the reason why we started using more genuine parts on the channel. Before, I'd have to go to my main dealer, which isn't exactly local. It's probably an easy 90 minute round trip. I'd have to order the parts and I'd have to wait 24 or 48 hours for them to come. Then I'd have to go back and make that 90 minute trip again. With Deutsch parts, they are cheaper. The delivery cost is included and they use really good couriers and pretty much every time I've used them, they've come next day, so quicker in most cases than ordering from a Volkswagen retailer. And the parts are exactly the same. So I've ordered a two year, 20,000 mile service kit for the TT, which as I mentioned earlier, oil, oil filter, pollen filter. It also comes with a sump plug and washer as well, often overlooked. And there should also be some brake fluid in here. So, all right, there's the filter with the plug and washer. That's the oil filter, because this is a pollen filter. It's a common Mark V one with a corner cut off. And this is, looks like the proper carbon activated one. So the, the one that would have left the factory with, there are cheaper ones you can get. And we've got five liters of 530 quantum, fully synthetic oil. And we need 4.6 litres, by the way, so it's just enough there and a bit for a top-up. And this is something that I've never seen before. It's a genuine Volkswagen brake fluid. And we've got a litre there, which is exactly what we need to do the brake fluid change. Right, let's just check there's nothing else in here. No. Let's get cracking. Okay, the car is now warmed up and it's raised in the air with the trolley jack. I've got an axle stand under the console bush. That's a sort of semi-circular place where you can put an axle stand nice. It's very strong in that area. I am, and I have for the last couple of videos, used a service called Irwin. It's basically a workshop manual by Volkswagen or Audi or Seat or Skoda. It tells you exactly how to do jobs from oil changes to changing cylinder heads and stuff like that with all the torque settings. This, for example, is a document for the brake fluid change we're going to do later. Also with Irwin, you can get a service checklist for your car. So you put in the mileage of the last service and what you want to do this time. And it gives you this, which is great. It tells you the amount of oil you need to put in and the grade of oil. Although actually this contradicts what we're going to use today, but I'll talk about that later. Now we need to get the oil out urgently while it's still warm. And it's got a really fiddly under tray on this TT. It's very much unlike a Golf under there, contrary to what people might tell you. We'll just remove the oil filler cap now. And it does actually say drain the, well, undo the oil filter first. Okay, that's now loose and draining into the sump. Now we have to get the under tray off. Believe it or not, we need three different torque bits. To do this, we need a T25, a T30, 
and a T45. So at the front we have one, two, three, four, five, T25, do not lose them because I'll probably end up in the tyre. And then on the side, one, two, Okay, that one's a little bit rusty. So that's nine T25s in total. At this point, it's not that different to a Golf. Okay, now we go T30 for the inner ones. So one here. Yeah, so these feel more like bolts and screws. And as a result, it needs quite a bit more torque because underneath, well, above the under tray, there's a frame, a reinforcer. I don't really know why the TT is so different, but it, it definitely feels more sophisticated down here. There's a lot more aluminium in its construction. Unfortunately, there are two more. So at the back here, ignore this bolt, here is another T30. This one feels pretty good. And finally, there's this big one at the back. So yeah, it's a pain, but they learnt from the Mark IV and the Mark I TT. That's captive a bit in there, so that's good. Right, now it's come off. So it's a bit different to a Golf. Um, but once you get that off, it's pretty similar, if not identical. So on the back of there, we should have a T45. So there is some logic into them using that. Yep. Oh no. Okay, do not loosen it before you get the tray there because this design of bolts doesn't like that. Okay, let's get the receptacles in position. Okay, so we're gonna change the plug. You can see, even though it's almost too hard, tight for me to undo by hand, it's still dripping, so that's really shows you how important the washer is. The plug itself doesn't really seem to, to do much. There we go. It's pretty black. It's been in the car for about 4,000 miles in a year. Um, but yeah, it doesn't look too great. But this is an early oil change, effectively, but it has been a year, so it is, it is due and we're heading for winter. And it's a change of an engine, so yeah, it's a uh, money well spent. Now, I've mentioned this before, because we're coming up to winter, but really any time of year, it's a good idea to do this. Grease whatever you can on your car when you're putting it back together, because it saves a lot of hassle. So these T30s are probably quite prone to seizing in position and you'll snap the head off if they do. 
and even the T25s, which aren't particularly high torque, if they get stuck in the speed clip, it's only a flimsy little thing they screw into, then you'll damage that and they'll never go back in securely. So yeah, just a little bit of grease can save a lot of grief. Okay, I've lowered the car down onto the ground to complete the drain. While that's happening, I'm gonna replace the oil filter. That should have drained out most of its oil, but just be aware there might be some still in it. And now to refit the new one. So we're gonna give the mounting flange a bit of a wipe with a clean cloth. Just check there's nothing on there that would affect the seal. I have lubricated the o-ring that you can just about make out on this one um, with some fresh oil so now we just need to thread it into position i've just lifted the uh, engine cover a bit to get a bit more room and it does say thread tighten by hand and it also says 20 newton meters and then the workshop manual says 22 so i think we'll go for the 22 but if you don't have a torque wrench then just do it as tight as you can with your hand which should be roughly 20, 22 newton meters. Okay, so we're gonna put that on there. And wait for the click. There we go. The drain will have completed by now, so we just need to get the sump plug back in, get that pesky under tray back on and then we can start filling it up with some fresh oil. Okay, the car's back in the air, it's had a really thorough drain. So what we need to do now is get the new sump plug back on, then get the under tray on, which is over there, and uh, then get some oil into it. So yeah, time to get underneath the car again. It's so unusual having a sump plug like this. I don't know whether they're just doing it to make it look different to a Golf or what, but not many owners will appreciate this. It's definitely a tight one. Cool. Okay, now for the under tray. Okay, so slot this in at the front first. And uh, yeah, slots in at the bumper. And then I would go for the biggie. Don't waste any time looking for the T45 because it's still on the under tray. Feels good. So just make sure it's in at the front, which it is. And now let's get on the ratchet. I don't have the torque settings for these, but I wouldn't recommend you go crazy. Okay, T30's next. And finally, as the rain gets heavier. all the scrabbling around on the floor I need to do which is just as well because the rain has started to come down so let's get the car on the ground and get some fresh oil into it not water before we pour the oil in let's just have a look at what, what we're pouring in the Audi checklist says 50101 50200 oil and this is for a fixed service interval so a year or 10,000 miles maximum on the oil the oil Deutsche parts are sent are a little bit better it's the 50400, 50700 oil, and that's because it's 
the long life oil for the TT. You can of course run this oil in it and change it earlier, there's no problem with that. If you want to save a bit of money, it probably won't be very much, you can use a 540 as long as you don't go over a year or 10,000 miles. And as you can see that's 50200 approved, but I think with cam chain cars it's probably best to put the best oil in that you can. So yeah, let's, let's get this in, 4.6 litres of it. Yeah, it's interesting how, compared to the EA Triple Eight Gen 3 engine, that Gen 2 has got a pretty decent oil filler hole. On the Gen 3s, it's like tiny and it's over on, over on this side of the engine. So this is a lot easier to pour in without spilling. Okay, I'm happy with that. Put the filler cap on before we forget. And let's uh, just give it a quick dip and see what the dipstick says. Generally, the suggested fill quantities are usually pretty accurate. So it's way over the max mark because we haven't started the engine yet. Um, so yeah, let's just do that. Okay, unusually we didn't get any timing chain rattle. That's a, a good thing. So now it's it's gonna take a bit of time to settle, but it's uh, it's quite low on the dipstick, so it's probably about a third of the way up. I never really show you clearly this, do I? But hopefully you can see that. Let's just have another dip. Yeah, it's getting higher, so it's getting closer to half now. So when the engine's warmed up and it's settled, I think you need to check it about a minute after turning the engine off and when the car's parked on the flat, which it isn't here, that should be pretty close to the max mark, but obviously check and top up accordingly. You should have 0.4 of a litre, 400 mil left in your container for that. Okay, now onto the pollen filter, which is the job I really kind of strangely enjoy doing. Okay, this is the pollen filter. So all the air that goes into the cabin gets filtered by this. There are plain paper versions and there are carbon versions. There might even be one in between, but always get the best one you can because it filters the air that goes to you. And that's probably more important than the engine. I think this is the carbon one. It's um, a genuine Volkswagen Group part made by man. And its location is not down here under the windscreen like it used to be. It's not in the glove box like it is on the later cars. It's actually down here, which I don't mind. So if you put your hand under here, you'll feel like a foamy, uh, like a liner. And in it are some plastic screws that you can easily undo with your fingers, like so. There are two of them. And they're pretty easy to pinpoint. Okay, that's the second one, so don't lose those. That should let you pull the liner down. Like so. So you can see the two screw holes. Um, probably best to keep it in the same orientation so you don't get confused. And that's doubly important with the filter. So down here is um, a rectangular plate made of plastic like that basically the bottom the bottom of the filter sits on it and you just have to slide that out so which way Let's see so it runs left to right and if you slide it that way it comes off so that's the thing holding the filter in Got an arrow on says open it that way you can see how it would slide in like that to lock it so again try and keep that in the orientation it was and now the filter should pull out 
and because this car lives outside under trees it's been quite a busy filter this one and I, think I changed it so it's not old 2020 October so definitely me so you can see in there there is a lot of tree debris bear in mind this has been in probably not even two years actually I think it was November 21 oh my god that is grim okay so take your new filter and it's got to go in with this cut off corner being on the outside of the car okay and when it's in position then you need to slot the retaining plate into place and that's it and then while you're down here put the foam liner back into place now on the mark 2 tt there are actually two service reminders one will count down for the oil change which is every year and there's another countdown for the services at two four six eight years and whilst we can reset the oil change one with the instrument cluster the other one we need a um, diagnostic device such as this one to do so let me show you it's still counting down to this one and if I pull this out, it won't reset it. It just resets the oil change one. So we need to go into VCDS. We need to go into the instruments module. We need to go into adaptation. And here we need to look for something that says inspection. So the oil change they call a service and the two year, four year, six, eight, they call inspection. So if you look here, you'll see it says distance since inspection so it's done one 17,100 kilometers since that inspection service was done well we can reset that now by saying zero test save okay and now we need to look at time since inspection which is getting on for two years it's got 60 days and then it'll be two years so let's find time since inspection so 670 days so 730 days in two years so it's 60 days less than two years but if we say zero test and it's happy with that so let's save it just reread it again zero okay so we won't turn that off just yet but we'll have a look on here so let's now pull the knob towards us and it says all change in 1500 kilometers 9400 miles and the service is now all the way up to 18,100 um not sure why it's 18,100 to be perfectly honest oh is that it probably equates to um something in kilometers but you can adjust that in here anyway if you want to but i'll just leave that as that we won't do 18,100 miles in two years in this cut anyway so that's the service reminder is completely reset now. Now we'll move on to the brake fluid change, which is slightly less straightforward. Now there are two really good reasons why you need to do the often overlooked brake fluid change. The first one is a brake fluid hygroscopic, which means that it attracts moisture to it and with moisture it loses its effectiveness and reduces its boiling point. But also because if you don't disturb the brake bleed nipples on a regular basis, they tend to seize into the calipers. And then when you need to do some urgent brake work like uh, replacing a brake hose or pipe, you'll find that you can't get the bleed nipple out and it'll more often than not shear in the caliper. And that will lead to a whole world of pain and expense. Now it's not expensive to get this job done at a garage. It's usually about 60 pounds or so. But there's a really good reason for doing it yourself and it's not to save money it's because you will get to have a good look at your car where it matters so you can take the wheels off you can clean up the flange that the wheels sit on on the hub to make sure they don't seize on most garages don't actually take the wheels off when they do a brake fluid change you can inspect the brake discs and pads closely so you know what to expect at the next service or mot i'm using this sealy clutch and brake bleeder it's about uh, 50 pounds or so 
but there's actually other ones on Amazon that are probably better. There's one that's on a Black Friday deal, and it comes with a, a waste fluid bottle as well, which this one didn't come with. So yeah, shop around, but this is definitely much better than using one of those easy bleed kits where you use a spare tire, because just to, to apply pressure, you just pump it up like this. Now I've used Audi's Irwin workshop manual to give me the instructions for this job, and it's telling me I need to do the front driver's side first, then the passenger side front second, then the driver's side rear, and then the passenger side rear. It's telling me I need a litre in total because I need to get 0.2 of a litre out of the fronts and 0.3 of a litre out of the backs. If you've got a manual gearbox, and obviously there's a hydraulic circuit for the clutch, which you should also bleed, and that's another 0.15 of a litre. So, yeah, it's always best to have a bit more, really. So probably I'd start off with 1.5 litres, whichever gearbox you've got. Tool-wise, well, apart from this bleeder, you need an 11 mil spanner to undo the bleed nipples. Now, I tend to loosen them off with a socket, and then I will do the bleeding process with a proper 11 mil brake spanner, which grips the nipple a bit more thoroughly than a normal spanner. But on the backs, access is tight because we've got a multi-link rear suspension and we've got four-wheel drive. So I tend to go in there with a normal spanner, but obviously loosen it with a socket first so you don't round off the nipple and then nip it up with a socket as well. Jacking up wise, I will jack up on the passenger side front and use an axle stand there. And then I will jack up the driver's side again at the front. That lifts both sides of the car up on the driver's side. Take those three wheels off, do it in the correct order, and then put the wheels back on, lower the car down on the passenger side, and then you can take the off the near side rear wheel off, do that job, put that wheel on, and job done. Now, as I said, it's not a job you do to save money because the equipment needed will cost you about the same as it would do to get the job done by a garage, but it's a job that comes around every two years, and basically the next job will be effectively free. And obviously, if you've got more than one car on your fleet, then you'll get payback a lot sooner than that. As ever, guys, thank you for watching this Volkswagen driveway DIY video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Please do comment, please do share, and please, please do subscribe. And I'll see you for the next one very soon. Big thanks to our sponsor on this video, Deutsche Parts. I'll put a link to their website in the description of this video. If you want genuine parts, you really can't beat them for service and price.